and it's mainly designed to provide solutions to alleviate challenges, accidents, and other burdens that uh, may affect us negatively in one way or the other. Um, there are basically three types of artificial intelligence. We have the narrow intelligence, the narrow artificial intelligence, which is basically the uh, first standard of AI that does basic stuff. Um, we have the general artificial intelligence, which has to do with more specific and uh, human level of intellectual implementations. So it's able to think and behave like humans. And then we have the super artificial intelligence. So the super artificial intelligence basically has the ability to evolve by itself, learn, and even do things better than we humans can. So if we look at it in that scope, then where does this artificial intelligence apply to our workforce? And how are we assured that this is not going to alleviate, uh, take away our jobs, but rather enhance our ability to deliver services? Being a tech person and having a company that provides solutions in the space of uh, solving problems, uh, we, we have a first-hand experience of applying some of these AI technologies and even building some of them ourselves. So we take the narrow artificial intelligence, for example. We see that the example is a Google Assistant, Siri, and all those platforms that we can interact with verbally, and they can give us basic information to quickly address uh, concerns that we have. We also have the general artificial intelligence, which has to do with things like the smart homes, the robots that provide services, and so on. So, for example, if I want to ask a quick question or want a quick navigation, I'm driving and I, I can't take my phone to type in a destination on the Google map, I can simply call out Siri or Google Assistant to just give me directions to this destination and it will just provide me the narration and I can just follow it through. The Google map is another form of artificial intelligence which is supposed to guide us through our paths in destinations. It should make it easier for businesses to get located uh, typically in Africa, for example, if we want to find a location to a business, most businesses and our address system in Africa is quite complicated. In Ghana, for example, if you ask someone for directions to a particular location, the direction you're likely to hear is turn right, turn left. When you go straight at the corner, turn right. And it sometimes gets very tedious and uncomfortable. But AI has come to help you just share the location to the person and it makes it easier. It saves you time. It gives you enough time to handle other things that you want to take care of. Then we come to the general artificial intelligence. So things like smart home technology, you have lighting, you have your heaters, you have your cleaners, vacuum cleaners. All of these things have been automated to the point where you can just, with a simple voice command, carry out a lot of tasks within the shortest possible time. Then the super artificial intelligence are the level where we are likely to lose our control over and that's a concern. Now, when you come to apply that in our occupation sense, how does artificial intelligence keep our job? First of all, it is important that we upgrade ourselves as employees or employers to understand technology and how to manage these things. These softwares and technologies need someone to implement them or use them. So a person who is a housekeeping uh, person in a hotel, for example, should be able to understand the in and out of using an automated vacuum cleaner by commanding and mapping out the locations. So in as much as the AI will be able to carry out some of these tasks, somebody has to be in charge of scheduling uh, the, the, the time to clean and the areas to clean and identify even spots that it's the it's AI may not be able to identify and guide it to carry out these activities. We also look at hotel bookings. Traditionally, a person will have to walk into a hotel to find out if a room is available or not before a front office person can address if the room is available. But with AI, I can actually be able to search for availability of a hotel, book it through the platform, and the front office person with the technical know-how will be able to assist me to assign me to my room. Then again, we look at food and beverage. So the hospitality sector is quite huge. Um, planning of our activities and the schedules are largely dependent on data that may necessarily not be available. But with AI, 
it makes you the person providing the service much more efficient and makes it convenient and increase consumership from consumers. So it means that traditionally, if you're able to attend to just five or 10 people in a day for your business, with the help of AI, you can attend to 20 or 30 people. That increases revenue. The only thing is that you, the person working, have to now upgrade yourself from being a traditional worker to becoming a smart worker by taking advantage of these technical technologies that are available and implementing them and knowing how to even manage them. You could even go a step further into understanding the maintenance of these uh, robots and hardware components of the AI platforms. And it even gives you a step, uh, a better advantage in terms of the occupational field. So AI is not here to replace our jobs. AI is here to make our work easier. It means that I can attend to more businesses within the shortest possible time because I have the aid or a tool that could make my work easier. Gone are the days where cutting of trees were being done with access. We then came to the era of using the chainsaws. Now there are robots that actually chop this log of woods for us. So yeah, AI is here to stay. We must understand that and accept that. But at the end of the day, AI is here to make our work much more efficient and um, better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, wonderful. I, I totally enjoyed um, both presentations and I believe our listeners um, all over the world, um, you know, also enjoyed, you know, the presentation. Thank you so much to our two speakers. Um, yes, we're going to make this in interactive, as I mentioned earlier. Please get ready your questions. We have heard from our speakers um, that AI is not here to take our jobs, rather it's here to enhance you know, the services that um, are offered to, uh, to to our customers. So please get ready your questions. I want to quickly recognize one of our guests. We have Mr. Samuel Kwashe, executive, um, executive of Tour Guides, executive secretary or director, I'm sorry, of Tour Guides Association and Global Ambassador for Africa Tourism Board. You're very much welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. And of course, let me also thank all our um, audiences from everywhere. I mean, I've seen people from Kenya, from Ghana, from Nigeria. Thank you so much for joining this series and this webinar today. And as I said earlier, please get your questions ready. Feel free to send them to the chat room. Um, that's your questions. And if you are not speaking, kindly mute your microphones, please. Uh, we're going right into, we're diving, taking a deep dive into the question and answer session right away. <clears throat> um, so please kindly start sending your questions in. I expect, a, a, you know, uh, a, an influx of questions. I mean, I have questions. I want to know, uh, would, would we have a time that um, AI would, would, be, would, would start, you know, guiding us around the uh, tourist sites and, and, and be tour, tour guides? <laughs> Are we going to have robotic tour guides at some point? You know, I mean, as you walk into hotel lobbies, you know, in today's um, uh, uh, world, you have uh, robots welcoming you. Some, some, some even you know you 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 have to impute your information on some and all that. I mean, we ha we we have all sorts. So I have I definitely have questions, and I want our speakers to get ready. Do we have any questions so far? Um, as I would now start to ask our speakers, our first speaker. We'll go first. Uh, I, and I want her to talk about the downsides of AI. What are the downsides? I mean, we've all we've heard all the beautiful stories about AI, how it helps us, how it makes things easy, and you know, um, so it stores information and you know, and all that. What are the downsides of AI? I mean, I I I would say that perhaps, you know, our privacy is not um, guaranteed or the privacy, I mean, by the time you supply all your information, you know, then that means uh, what happens to, to that information? So I, I, I would want, and I'm curious, 
What are the downsides of AI, Ambassador Carr? Okay, so um, basically, I mean, we live in um, a world where most things are of dual natures, the good, the bad, the black, the white, the um, strong, the weak, you know. So um, the, the, the aspect of building on artificial intelligence, which we have said is the quantum of data that humans have already computed and through quantum computing accesses it through, you know, using um, algorithms and through mining those data in such a way that machine learning would specialize it. So what happens is it gets to a point where the, the, the intelligence being exhibited by all this quantum of information moves far ahead of human thinking. Because remember, there are various different platforms globally where we're picking this intelligence from. So in, in such a way, when it's computing, it triggers off the series of you know, um, algorithms that will make it move very far ahead of human beings. And that's where the fear is, that we might not be able to know when to call a halt if these things get out of hand in such a way. So I'll give you one um, example, not a very pleasant one. So there's this air, you know, manufacture, aircraft manufacturing company years ago. So they, they built aircraft like they wanted to test what it would be like to just have softwares even though the pilots will be sitting in the cockpit, you have the softwares flying the aircraft. And they were probably still testing some of these softwares. And what happened was there was a misconception by the pilot sitting who hadn't been upgraded to the use of that software. And when that error kept reading, on the screen, he didn't really know what to do to be able to revert back to the manual way of flying that aircraft. And this resulted in an air crash. So exactly, that, that was really horrendous. And then this was what, you know, probably the test was about to know where the gaps would be in that artificial intelligence to be able to mitigate it before such crashes happen and so it gets to the point where some of this information being gathered that artificial intelligence is acting upon could actually be used against those human beings there was um, a video i watched sometime last year and it i mean it made my hair stand on ground it was a military intelligence video and what it said was that what artificial intelligence can do with you know unethical military product is that it has your information and wherever you are on the surface of the earth that information could be used to get you wherever you are through artificial intelligence so what this means is there is no hiding place for you as an individual as long as you've left digital footprints that artificial intelligence can act upon in, in, you know, technology can be able to drive a drone, even if you're hiding under a rock, it will use artificial intelligence to be able to recognize you. where you mm -hmm. are, make true thermal imaging and true GPS and true all the information that has been gathered and artificial intelligence is acting on to be able to get to where you are globally. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amazon Kara, for um, that brilliant um, response. Um, I think at some point, you know, it's it's needful for us to um, push na the narrative that, um, you know, AI or technology, I mean, we already have, um, um, you know, the school of thoughts that um, uh, chat GPT or chat BOT or whatever you call it, you know, has to be regulated. You know, there's some, there, there, there have been calls across the world now in the technology space that, um, we, you know, there should be some form of regulation. You know, um, like you said, um, once you leave your digital footprint, you do not have control 
over that, you know. So yeah, so that needs to be. Uh, we need to look at that very closely uh, and watch, uh, you know, um, how things evolve with regards to that. You know, yeah, but, you know, technology really has come to stay. But at the same time, don't forget Africa Tourism Research Network is about ethical, responsible tourism uh, in the travel and uh, tourism and the hospitality space. So this is definitely our focus. And, um, you know, um, we are looking at this, at this very closely. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador Clara. I would want to ask our second speaker. Before then, we have some hands up. Um, yeah, before I take the hands, I would want to please remind us, if you're not speaking, please uh, mute your microphones to avoid um, interferences from the background. Thank you. I'd like to call on um, Owusu Adu Bohen. Kindly uh, ask your question. You have a floor, please. So mute yourself and ask a question. We have a minute for each question. Okay, I am not so sure if Hello. it goes right. Okay, yes, please. Yes. Yes, my name is Ousu Um I'm with African Tourism Research Center. I'm actually the vice president. Uh, my question goes to Mr. Isaac Alote. Isaac, are you here? Please go ahead. Yes. So I want to know how AI can help the hotel industry managers like the food and beverage manager or the front desk manager to enhance their work and work more efficiently. Isaac. Yes, all right. Thank you for the question. So the the hotel industry in terms of management and the food and beverage industry, AI in itself will have to focus on the problem specific. So currently, what are the challenges that they are facing will be the first question as a developer. So for example, if you want to keep track of your workers coming in and out of the work uh, place, what time they check in, what time they check out, we have the AI platforms or services that allows them to log in, probably connected to their phone. So it could be an app on their phone that communicates with a, third, a second device within the premises. And so the moment the person leaves the perimeter of the environment, you are alerted that this person has logged out or left the premises within this duration. Secondly, we look at the booking in terms of money. We have FinTech services that work with AI. And how does that help you? It means that you don't necessarily have to monitor or have someone keeping track of revenue coming in. AI services can actually manage the influx of revenue. What time the person paid the money, uh, what service was the person was the money paid for? All these things can be automated and managed by the artificial intelligence. That means that you could even be asleep, and all these activities will be done by the AI for you. And you just go in there and then just keep track of the analyzed data that you can tell that at the end of the day. You had 50 people logging into your hotel. You have 100 people buying this type of food at your restaurant. And this is the time that they bought the food. With that information, you'll be able to determine when your peak demands are. So let's say I own a restaurant. I cook food and I sell. And the food I'm selling, I get most of my purchases on Mondays and Tuesdays. The AI can put together that data for you and let you know that on Mondays and Tuesdays, it's advisable to cook this quantity of food for this number of people. Something that an analysis stands you were unable to do before. This is where the AI comes in. So that's how AI is going to help a lot of the industry in terms of resources. And uh, it helps you save resources and materials. You don't waste your resources and materials. You're able to plan much more efficiently. I hope it's answered. Yeah, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for the question. Um, I'd love to quickly take, um, we have a couple of questions now and we have to mini hurry. Um, Gamma, am I right? I'm sorry if yeah. I didn't pronounce your name properly. Yeah, Please, yeah, yeah you are right. Uh, thank you. Can you, you hear me? The, you have the phone. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is, my first name is Desta. Uh, I'm Ethiopian. Uh, I'm uh, 
Uh, currently, where are you I'm, joining us from? Where are you uh, joining us from? I, I'm, I'm joining from Frankfurt, from Germany. Oh, from, wow, from wonderful. Germany. Uh, but I'm Ethiopian. Uh, you know, uh, I represent uh, uh, really in this regard. Uh, I would like to thank my brother Emmanuel. Uh, we are working together with the initiative of African Tourism for Peace Initiative. Maybe if he's hearing me. Uh, uh, so uh, you know this. Uh, uh, Topics are very important for, especially for Africans. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, uh, uh, tourism is very uh, untapped uh, potential and resource of Africa. So even we didn't, uh, uh, you know, utilize it in, in a traditional way. Now, when the te technology comes again, seriously, we have to engage with uh, the, this technology, uh, artificial intelligence and tourism. So for this, uh, my question is. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm the chairperson of African Tourism for Peace Initiative. That platform is a, a sub uh, uh, platform of African Union Peace Initiative platform. So we are plugged with African Union. So I want to ask, uh, uh, I mean, the presenters that, uh, you know, um, even uh, for Africa, of course, we are not let. Even today, uh, I heard in CNN that even Americans, they are as as a as a policy level uh, in in the White House, they are discussing. Even the President Biden today he uh, invited all his AI experts, and then they want to regulate, and then they are worried. Uh, even they are saying that AI uh, and then uh, Chat GPT may uh, destroy humanity after uh, ten years or. Uh, uh, so they are worried. So we need even for Africans uh, to come as a continental level one for capacity building and training as as a tourism sector professionals, and then information exchange, and then policy and regulation, uh, and then also uh, you know to 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 have common common platform. We need we need such such issues so that our our conversations and then. Uh, debates and then the capacity building may grow and then we will be uh, positively uh, tap this big okay. opportunity as Africa. So we have to come together uh, in, in one platform. So what do you recommend for African uh, continent, maybe for African Union uh, to, look, to, to regulate? Because Afri I mean, Americans, they are worried about uh, not only the positive, but the negative like crime, cyber crime, misinformation, biases. That, ca that are coming through uh, this AI. So Africans also, we have to be very conscious about the negative aspect of uh, AI, but of course, uh, wisely, we have to uh, utilize for our tourism uh, uh, and hospitality. Of course, very huge uh, potential uh, for AI to use uh, because we have, we have very rich resource and uh, 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 products uh, that still we didn't uh, market it. So for our marketing strategy, for promotion, AI is very important. But we need to come together. We need to uh, regulate. We, we need to have a common, common, common uh, knowledge. Uh, and then capacity building is very important. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what do you recommend for this? Uh, thank you very mm -hmm. much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would love Ambassador Kara to respond to that. Okay, so basically, um, like, you know, I had mentioned um, the last, you know, interaction we had and talked about the um, dangers inherent in, you know, um, artificial intelligence and its capabilities. It's basically um, a scenario of not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I had mentioned the issue of duality. But what I'm looking at is that the world... I mean, you use it as a cliche, the train has left the station. You know, it's going to be a bit of a challenge trying to pull back what has already moved ahead. It's like setting, um, you know, something into motion and it's gone off like an aircraft flying off. You don't mm -hmm. draw it back immediately. So the, the, the point is now the scientists who were at the early days of quantum computing talking about the dangers that are inherent if this is let loose without the, the, the guidance of how to mitigate the dangers that will come with it. 
you know, if they had been listened to by the big tech companies, perhaps we might not be talking about this today. But look, it's the chase of the dollar. It's the chase of the money. You could see in the past few months how the big tech companies have been fighting each other to move ahead, to take advantage of what AI has to offer, despite, you know, the hoopla about all the dangers involved in it. So if we're talking now about governments coming in at policy levels to be able to set policies in place, it's not too late. But in doing that, we should also not be able to stifle what artificial intelligence is achieving for the world. I can give you, um, you know, very basic examples of what things like language modeling can do for us. I mean, I'm also a practicing journalist. I can go for my events. I can record my voice you know, you know, voice interviews. And I just get home and I feed it into my software. And all it just does for me, it gives me a transcript of all that I have interviewed. So I don't need to sit down and manually begin to transcribe my interview. That is really heavily very helpful for a lot of people. But when you look at the dangers of what things like GPT is doing, we've talked about the issue of plagiarism of it going into the deep end and digging out information that has been, you know, fed into it and it's acting on algorithm and answering your question for you, there is definitely no way those informations are original. Those were information fed into the internet in, you know, what we call um, quantum computing. And then it's gone inside and brought it out, processed it at fast speed and given it back to me. So when I put that out as my content, it's going to be looked at as if I plagiarized somebody's content because somebody actually wrote that before the computer grasped it. So yes, there are dangers in artificial intelligence. And like Africa, we have no, you know, we have no, um, would I call it, we cannot now sit at the back and watch the world take off. Everything is happening in real time. We don't have to learn years from people's mistakes. If governments are already talking about policies, it's time we also begin to look at policies. Let's get the round pegs and the round holes. Who are those that are very adept at what's going on now globally concerning artificial intelligence? Africans, can we call them into the picture and begin to look at ways that we can work towards this, enhancing what artificial intelligence can do for us by mitigating the dangers at the early level? Awesome. Thank you very much, um, Sada Clara, for um, th that perspective about, you know, calling ourselves together, you know, scientists, technologists, you know, Africans, let's come together. Let's have a, let's have this discussion. Let's start this discussions, you know, and let's 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 set the ball rolling. It seems we are watching things happen, you know, and things are really happening fast. And if we are not careful, we may not be able to catch up. You know, we may not, and we need to catch up first before we are able to say, "Oh, look, um, this is these are these are the points where you know these are things that are working that will work for us in Africa. These are the things that may not work for us, or that you know at this degree or at that at this level, you know that we need to um, you know measure or that we need to uh, know how to apply you know this technology. So um, this takes me. Thank you very much, Ms. Clara. This takes me, I have a question and I'm going to take, I think, one or two more questions and because I have less than 10 minutes to wrap up um, this webinar. Um, uh, I want to go straight to Kenya now, uh, to Kasanga Muki, who is uh, joining us, who joined us from Mombasa, Kenya. He's a founder of trustee of Living and Tourism Trust. It's a nonprofit sustainable tourism development advocacy organization. And he's asking, <clears throat> he's asking that how um, should we be selective? I mean, just like I've said, should we be selective in the areas in which we adopt AI? Um, and also he says that has this research identified and drawn the line between which areas we can outrightly cede to AI and which ones we need to go slow and in his words and most importantly which one we cannot cede to AI 
You know, it's basically just asking, look, how can we apply AI in a way that it w- we won't get our hands burnt? You know, it won't hurt us. Um, rather, it will enhance, you know, our work. Um, I don't know. Would, um, would, would Isaac love to take this question? Yes, I believe okay. I can, can come you. in. All right. Thank you very much. This, this is a very important question. Um, so as a technical person, personally, if we are building platforms, these are some of the questions we ask ourselves. Um, is this AI component we are integrating in the platform really necessary? What problem is it going to solve? I believe in selecting an AI platform is a matter of preference. So for example, if my area of work has to do with me meeting with people with diverse languages, and I am not accustomed to speaking those languages, I can fall on Google Translator. Then I ask the question, how can Google Translator harm me? In the long term, is it going to be able to um, help me learn these other languages and interact with the people much more efficiently, or it's going to harm me in a way? If we look at a negative component, the worst that that AI can do if it becomes conscious at the super in, uh, artificial intelligence level would mean that it could be translating a different language to me because it's conscious. The worst it can do is to tell me something else that, a pe- that is different from what a person is saying. Knowing very well that I don't understand the language and that I have to fall on that AI to become our interpreter. It means that we are trying to replace the human component of an, uh, of an interpreter. But how does that person who has access or the ability to speak these languages come in to help alleviate that problem? We would have to eventually build upon that inter- intermediary where we have to let the AI work hand in hand with someone who is an interpreter. So the choice of selecting an AI component is preferential. If you think that falling on a solution that is AI-based would make a component of work much more easier for you, that you would have enough time to focus on other relevant things, then that choice is totally up to you as to whether it can go the other way. These things are to be done by research. So every the, so I, I actually applaud the concern that Africa has to now wake up and come together to define the boundaries of AI. We as technicians are building platforms. My mentality may be to provide a solution to someone with a problem. But that solution could also give birth to another problem. How is Africa prepared to stand for these challenges that may arise? We are new to the game, of course. And Africa is now starting to grasp these ideas and opportunities. We are not too late, but we have the better opportunity to actually regulate and take decisions, either by building the platforms ourselves and and detaching ourselves from what has been built by the West, and therefore giving us the ability to control these things much more easily. Or finding a way to regulate how we use what is being fed to us as Africans. So yes, the choice of AI is preferential. The dangers that may evolve from it is not fully understood yet. It's all based on what our instincts are telling us or what the scale of the its evolvement appears to be. So you have AIs driving self, uh, having self-driving cars in Teslas. The question and concern is, if cars eventually get to drive themselves, how are they going to harm us? How is Africa preparing itself for such mm-hmm. challenges and events that are, are coming our way? And so these are concerns, and we need to address them technically and also with the layman's perspective. I don't, I don't know if I've answered the question. Oh, absolutely. For me, yes. <laughs> and I believe for um, our brother from Mombasa, thank you very much. Uh, I think the most uh, profound thing that I was able to pick from what you said is that we need to get ready. We need to begin to, um, you know, we need to get come to the table and look at, you know, what this technology is all about and the whole gamut of um you know um new technologies and you know begin to map you know uh, map the way forward and marshal plans on how we can um you know take advantage of it and at the same time you know um define the boundaries like you said in your words you know so thank you very much um isaac for um very you know profound um, response thank you so much um i have a question but i want to quickly ask um bethel from Nigeria. 
Bethel, it's great to have you here. Please, you have the floor. Oh, thank you. My name is Bethel Musiglad. I'm a top writer on the Mambila Play to Nigeria. Now, if this session will be interactive, as Ambassador said, I want to stand contrary to what we are trying to push. To me, and to be truthful, AI is coming to take our job. For example, now, just as one of the speakers, I think uh, Isaac, Ambassador Isaac, if I'm getting that right, said, cited an example that uh, when there is a need to cut tree with our cutlasses, and AI now is coming to shop the log for us, 10 people that will cut the tree we actually lose their job for AI for one AI. So I think uh, what we should discuss now is how do we cope with this? AI is coming to take our job. So how do we now fall in to meet up with this new development? That is my own side of view to this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bethel. Um, I mean, <laughs> you're, so, you're so militant about the fact that, look, AI, I'm not... <laughs> I'm not having any of this, you know, this narrative. AI is coming to take our jobs and we really need to know how we're going to cope. You know, I mean, it's great to have different perspectives. You know, it depends on from um, which angle you're seeing it from. Uh, but the bottom line is, you look, we need to get ready. We need to prepare ourselves. Um, yeah. I am of the school of thought. I'm going to allow our sp our speakers to answer your question, but I just want to quickly put something um, out there that, you know, I, for me, my, my thoughts about this is that you gave uh, um, an, um, an analogy about the, you know, cutting a tree, right? And that 10 people cutting a tree and, you know, where, where you have AI in the picture, AI, you know, sort of, um, you know, cuts them out and, you know, just goes ahead to, to solve that problem. But remember, whilst uh, our speakers were you know, breaking down and explaining uh, the discussion, the, the, the mention somewhere that um, you, you know, the human factor, the human component is not totally, it's not totally out of the picture. It's the human beings, or, right? It's, 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 the, it's human beings that would kind of map what AI is going to do, okay? It's, it's human beings that would, um, you know, that would, that would put in place the kind of, create a framework within which AI is going to function. So, so I think it's, 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 um, it's kind of a, a transition from actually doing the hard work to, to creating a framework and having technology to do the hard part of the work. For me, that is how I, I see it. But I mean, look, let me allow our speakers to take this. Um, Ambassador Kara, what do you think? <laughs> Okay, so basically, um, I find it quite intriguing because definitely it still keeps going back to what I mentioned about duality. There definitely will be, um, you know, um, those who have a buy-in and those who have a buy-out. So, um, like the speaker mentioned, why don't you look at the scenario? How um, about if you are like 10 investors who contribute money together and buy one of those robots, you know, who can be programmed through AI to cut those trees. And then people who do then need your services because you are investors in that robot, you keep using it to make money. You see, you're not doing the hard work anymore, but your investment is working for you because wherever you take the robot to and program it and cut down the tree, you're paid for it and you get Mm. Um, I don't know. We lost the last part of your comment. Please, what did you say? What? Okay, yes, please. I, yes. So I think with the analogy um, of, for example, the tree cutting being replaced by uh, an AI for 10 people, then I want to ask him the next question. When that AI or machine breaks down, you still need people to fix it. So I think the foundation of solving this problem is taking a look at our educational system and the programs that we are carrying out to now transform everything from being a theoretical and skilled labor force 
to more of like the maintenance culture of these services. So definitely the AI may do the work, but you still need humans on ground to carry out the, re the remaining component. The AI may cut the trees down. It may carry it to a destination. But initially, if you cut the trees, you still have to go and process the trees yourself. So there's still some job left for you. But however, that machine needs to be maintained by another set of people. What if these people, the additional nine people that are probably thinking they are going to lose their jobs, go to study on how to maintain this machine when it breaks down? It means that you still get to now maintain your job, but rather in an upgraded fashion. And so you need to look at it in that angle that, hey, if this is likely to take my job, why don't I then upgrade myself to take its job by being its caretaker? This is how we need to start looking at it. And that means that everything about education has to change now. Whatever courses we are learning in our universities, in our secondary schools, all these courses have to change and start looking at it in a different dimension. Because those programs were set up years ago for a particular task, which are now being obsolete because new ways of doing those tasks are being developed. Can we now look at education in a different direction and develop our mentality to now be responsible for these items that we are developing? So I think that is the solution to some of, some awesome. of one of the solutions to our problems as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. So we need to look at um, our, I mean, um, our brother from Germany, uh, the Ethiopian from Germany, he mentioned capacity building. He mentioned technological transfer, knowledge transfer. You know, um, so yes, we need to look at our curriculum. We need to look at our educational system and, uh, you know, infuse into our curriculum this information, this knowledge, these capacities. So we need to capacitate ourselves as, uh, as Africans to, um, number one, uh, even be in that space to continue to innovate. And of course, like you said, to, you know, when we, when we have AI solving these problems, you know, we are the back end also uh, enabling you know the technology that is solving the problem am i right i hope i'm right <laughs> yeah yes, so right. so 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 thank you very much um we're rounding up the q a session in half a minute are there any questions before we draw the curtain on today's webinar we're still going to have our host um share his remarks before we close Maybe, I think be, 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 Bethel before. has his hand or her hand up. Bethel, yeah. Bethel. Bethel, you still yes. want to ask a question? Is the, is the, the, the question he oh, asked? Sorry, I've been attended to. Apologies. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. fine. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Um, it's, it's been great, you know, having this conversation today. I have learned a lot and I believe um, all our, um, our audiences have also, you know, uh, will be going away with them. Um, quite a lot from, from this um, discussions and this engagements. And I want to remind you that um, this is not the, the last, this is the first, but it's not the last uh, in series. So it's a series and, you know, definitely you have to look out for the next edition of this interesting um, webinar. I want to call on our host right away for his closing remarks. Once again, my name is Abigail Ola. Baye. I'm the founder of Sayari Dunia Sustainable Tourism Foundation, uh, which is a climate action um, NGO based in Nigeria. I'm also the CEO of the Seagull Tourism Development and Facilities Management Company, a destination management company. Thank you very much. Our host will close the event. Thank you. Wow. All too soon, we, we've come to an end, uh, but let me take this opportunity once again to thank our speakers, Ambassador Clara, uh, Isaac Alote, and our wonderful moderator, Ambassador Abigail, and all the participants. We are grateful. I know we uh, didn't have much time, uh, but I think within this short period, we've learned a lot. I have learned a lot. And uh, I think what we are going to do is to have series of this kind of webinar, not just on AI, but uh, any other thing. I think one brother mentioned that tourism has so much potential in Africa, but we are not harnessing the potential of tourism in Africa. And I think these are some of the means that we'll be using to actually drive home tourism in Africa. Everybody that is into development knows that 
the next continent to really take the world to a different level is Africa. But if we don't learn to actually get into technology, this AI thing that is going on, we'll be left behind. And sadly, we might, we might, we might be taken up by these developed nations. So we seriously need to understand what is going on and actually get our hands into it, sit on the table of decision-making and be part of whatever is going on. We cannot sit back and watch what the world is doing. And then we are taken surprised by it. So once again, thank you. Uh, we've received messages uh, behind the scenes about partnerships. We are open to partner with any institution organization that wants to partner with us to promote tourism, sustainable tourism, ethical tourism, and responsible tourism. And of course, one of the core objectives of African Tourism Research Network is to have credible data for decision making. In Africa, most often we don't have credible data to use for decision making. And we want to use this opportunity to research and have credible data that we can use for advocacy, advocacy and also to make decisions. So thank you very much. I uh, wish you all the best in uh, the week and hopefully we will come together very soon and share our thoughts. As we mentioned, Clevernard recorded this live. They will play it again on their TV station and also on their FM and uh, they are all over in Europe. And then we also have this recorded uh, that will be on YouTube. We actually were live on YouTube. So it is there. If you go there right now, you have it there. So thank you once again. Let's collaborate, let's partner, and let's work together to make tourism in Africa a successful one. Thank you. God bless you all. Thank you, Manish. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Mm -hmm.